Good afternoon, just. Uh, welcome to Chatham House, everybody. Minister, welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, be chairing this, uh, what I hope to be rather intriguing and interesting event. Uh, the title is China's Modernization and the Relationship with the West. And uh, it is a privilege for Chatham House to be uh, welcoming Minister Liu Chanchou to uh, share his thoughts with us for 20 minutes uh, on that topic. And then I will uh, quiz you. Um, and then I will turn it over to the audience, um, yourselves here live, and uh, a significant number of people online uh, to explore uh, probably only a few of the endless topics um, that uh, are on the edge of everybody's mind. Um, to set the scene uh, for myself in my own excitements and anticipation for today, um, as an economist by training, as most people uh, watching or sitting here know, um, uh, the marvel of, of uh, the en enormous uh, rise of the Chinese economy and its influence on the world, going back to your first days here in London in the mid-80s. I'm sure that's not just a coincidence. Uh, is, is truly uh, quite something. Um, but of course, uh, as no doubt will become part of the discussions um, in the past few years, particularly since uh, the unfortunate developments with COVID, um, there are some doubts about uh, China's ability to sustain the momentum to that growth. Uh, and of course, uh, some pretty, pretty big uh, questions about um, how China uh, is in, interacting with the rest of the world and uh, engaging. And indeed, uh, I, I have to say, because of course, Ch on the one hand, Chatham House being uh, what it is, uh, beautifully, this uh, amazing think tank for global affairs, uh, but also of its history. Um, we ourselves have a little bit of controversy in hosting you here today uh, because of some of those topical issues. Uh, and if uh, I warn you in advance, I am going to bring some of them up later. <laughs> Um, and so with that in mind, uh, let me turn it over to you, Minister, and thank you very much uh, for joining us. Let me just say, and I'll repeat it for when it, as you think about questions, uh, we are on the record. Uh, the Chatham House rule, therefore, will not really apply because it's on the record. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I warn you all in advance, questions, not your own philosophical statements of how you want life to be. Otherwise, your question might get adjusted or ignored. But we'll come back to that later. Minister, over to you. you. I certainly pledge to, to observe the uh, Chatham House rules, but, um, it's, but it's a little bit very um, transparent in here. You know, for diplomat, when you, when you speak, you try to stand upright in the upper body, but it's trembling in the lower part of the body. <laughs> and uh, yes, very nice, very nice to see you, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear Lord O'Neill, and thank you very much for the warning. Uh, but I wish to begin by thanking the Chatham House for the invitation and Lord O'Neill for your warm words. I spent some time in London uh, in the uh, middle 1990s. I was in the, working with the embassy. So I knew the Channel Ambas pretty well. It is a well, world-renowned think tank and opinion leader. So with a century-long history. She is the founding head of many strategic thinking and policy ideas. So every time I read your research papers, I do feel enlightened. As the birthplace of international of industrial revolution, the United Kingdom was the birthplace 
sorry, the United Kingdom was the place China first turned to when it opened its eyes to the world. Well, not only on, well, when after the People's Republic of China was founded, but it's done as an eye experience experience for the Chinese in the late 19th century when we sent diplomats and envoys to our delegation in the same place and where the embassy is today. And personally, it was where I started to know about the West. So 37 years ago in 1986, the same year when I joined the Foreign Service, I came to this country as a student. That was the first time I ever set my feet on a foreign land. It was quite an eye-opening experience, and I was overwhelmed by the modernity and the natural and cultural heritage. So, but, but believe it or not, what is more amazing is that after I spent a year in the UK and when I returned home in Beijing, I got lost in the streets in Beijing. Earth shattering changes took place during my short uh, one year absence from China. As back then, China was on the, right, on the track to take off thanks to the opening up and reform policy. 40 years on, so much has changed in China and around the world. Humanity is faced with more challenges than ever. That's why it's all the more important for us to talk and listen to each other for greater understanding and stronger cooperation. As many of you haven't had a chance to go back to China for some time due to the COVID, there must have been a lot of questions in your mind about China. For instance, what is going on in China at the moment? What does Chinese modernization mean for the world? What kind of relationship does China hope to build with the West and the rest of the world? I'm happy to try my best to share my views. I'll begin with what we are doing at home. As you may know, the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China last October elected the new central leadership of the party and with Xi Jinping at his call and drew a blueprint for the next five years and beyond to advance the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation through a Chinese path to modernization. I'd like to uh, use four catchwords to summarize our work priorities at home. The first is highly high quality development. High quality development is our number one task to build China into a modern socialist country. Though we have put an end to extreme poverty and realized the dream of a well-off society, China is still a developing country. Imbalances and inadequacies in development remain a prominent problem. In 2022, China's per capita GDP was about 12,700 US dollars, less than one third of that of the UK. That is why the Communist Party of China regards development as its top priority in governing and rejuvenating China. Going forward, we'll apply the new development philosophy that pursues innovative, coordinated, grain, open and inclusive growth so as to achieve high quality of development and create a better life for our people. Statistics from January to May this year show a momentum of steady recovery of investment, consumption, import and export, giving us the confidence to achieve the growth target of about 5% in the beginning, which, which we said in the beginning of this year. The second word is reform and opening up. This year marks the 45th anniversary of China's reform and opening up, opening up policy, a policy that has transformed China tremendously. We remain committed to that policy 
no matter how the external situation could possibly evolve. We'll take even greater strides and deepen reform on all fronts and promote high standard opening up. Reforms will be pressed ahead to build a socialist market economy where the market plays the decisive role in the resource allocation and the government better plays its role. We'll unswervingly deepen SOE reforms and support the growth of private sector by encouraging entrepreneurship and ensure fair competition. <coughs> we'll open wider the service sector, cut shorter the negative list of, for foreign investment, protect the rights and interests of foreign investors, and create a market-oriented, law-based business environment that meets the international standard. We welcome more British investment and stand ready to work with the United Kingdom to keep the global industrial supply chains stable and smooth. The third catchword is the rule of law. The rule of law and good governance are something all people hope to enjoy. Since the 18th Communist Party National Congress in 2012, progress has been made in advancing socialist democracy and the rule of law. According to the Social Attitude Survey released by the China National Statistics Bureau, for most Chinese citizens, when one or one's family encounters injustice, their first choice to undo it is through legal means. It shows a marked increase in people's confidence in our legal system. In our legal system. Moving forward, we'll keep the path of socialist political advancement with an emphasis on the whole process people's democracy. We also endeavor to improve the Chinese-style socialist legal system with the Constitution at its core, advance law-based government administration, ensure strict and impartial administration of justice, and build a law-based society. Special attention will be given to protect human rights, IPR, and the legitimate rights and interests of entrepreneurs. Britain has a long tradition of the rule of law, and on the journey ahead, we hope to set up exchanges and mutual learning with you. The fourth word is clean government. For many years, corruption was rampant in China. The CPC is keenly aware of its harm. That is why the Communist Party of China was, has launched unprecedented anti-corruption campaign as an important step to ensure full and rigorous self-governance. Thanks to such efforts, China's ranking in the 2022 Corruption Perception Index of transparent, International Transparent jumped upward by 35th place compared to 2014. The fight was tough. So my feeling is that as long as the breeding grounds and conditions for corruption exist, we must never rest, not even for a minute, in our fight against corruption. We'll continue to focus on both the symptoms and the root causes and stick to the holistic approach to ensure that officials do not have the audacity, opportunity, and desire to become corrupt. We hope to compare notes with and strengthen international cooperation on corruption with our British colleagues and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, China, while advancing its modernization drive at home, will remain committed to world peace and common development and strive to build a human community with a shared future. By pursuing this Chinese modernization that covers a huge population, will also contribute to common development of the world. Achieving modernization for China, a country with more than 1.0 billion population, has profound 
global significance in itself. General Secretary Xi Jinping has put forth the Global Development Initiative, highlighting development as a priority and stressing the need to build a united, equal, balanced, and inclusive global development partnership. Implement the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable, sustainable Development at a faster pace and achieve stronger, greener, and healthier global development that leaves no country or individual behind. With this in mind, we will call on all countries to keep the WTO, APEC, and other multilateral institutions function well and support cooperation mechanisms such as the BRICS in playing a bigger role. China has all along played an active role in international cooperation on poverty elevation. Let's focus on the underdeveloped countries and impoverished people and ensure that the development results are shared by all peoples in a fairer manner. By pursuing Chinese modernization that emphasizes material and cultural ethical advancement, we also contribute to building an open and inclusive world. Modernization is not only about material abundance, but also about cultural ethical enrichment. In pursuing modernization, we draw upon the merits of all civilizations, advocate cultural inheritance and innovation, and the respect for the diversity of civilizations. General Secretary Xi Jinping has put forward the Global Civilization Initiative, highlighting the need for tolerance, coexistence, exchanges, mutual learning among civilizations. We are ready to work with the rest of the world to promote international people-to-people uh, -people exchanges and build a global network for inter-civilization dialogue to open up a new prospect where cultures and are integrated and people are connected through exchanges. Chinese modernization stresses harmony between man and nature. China will com promote concerted efforts to cut carbon emissions, reduce pollution, expand green development, and pursue economic growth. China supports developing countries in their pursuit of energy, energy transition green development, and low-carbon growth. We are ready to work with the rest of the world to build a community of all life on Earth that benefits future generations. By pursuing Chinese modernization of peaceful development, we will also contribute to building a world of lasting peace. To modernize China, we need a peaceful and stable external and internal environment. While a modernized, a modernized China will in turn contribute to world peace and stability, Xi Jinping has put forth the Global Security Initiative, underlining the need to pursue common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, respect the sovereignty and territorial credit, uh, integrity of all countries, take their legitimate security concerns seriously, and resolve differences and disputes in a peaceful manner through dialogue and consultation. China has played a constructive role in the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis and facilitated the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which has inspired greater reconciliation in the region. China is the only country in the world that has committed itself to peaceful development of, in the Constitution and the only country among the five nuclear weapon states to pledge no first use of nuclear weapons. We hope to work with the rest of the world for peaceful settlement of disputes through consultation and dialogue and let the sunshine of peace shine on the earth at an early date. What I want to bring your attention to is that the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global 
civilization initiative really constitute the uh, key pillars of the vision to build a humanity, a human community with a shared future. They're all open to the United Kingdom and we hope to see your support. Ladies and gentlemen, I talk about China's strategic arrangement to advance Chinese modernization and what it seems to the West and the world, but some friends may still wonder what kind of relationship China wants to build with the rest of the world. What the common ground is between China and the United Kingdom. So um, I'll try to share my observations. Question number one, will China become more inward looking as it talks more about self-reliance? Indeed, China has accelerated efforts to foster a new development pattern that is focused on the domestic economy and features positive interplay between domestic and international economic flows. But let me be clear, for domestic circulation to function well, it needs stronger international cooperation, more foreign trade and better use of foreign direct investment. As champions for free trade, it's shared responsibility for China and the UK to eject unilateralism, protectionism, decoupling, cutting supply chains, and building small yards with high fences. We need to embrace openness, inclusiveness, and win-win cooperation to keep world economy stable and prosperous. Question number two. Will China ignore development as it talks more about security? Indeed, China has highlight, highlighted the importance of security, just as all other countries do. We believe high quality development can only be achieved in a highly secure environment. But what we pursue is a balance between security and development, and we'll never ignore the issue of development. As Deng Xiaoping pointed out many years ago, that development is the key solution to all the problems that China is faced with. Because we believe that development holds the key to solve all the problems in China. So in the report to the 20th CPC National Congress, the word development was mentioned 239 times. The CPC will continue to stay focused on growing economy and pursuing development. As both China and the UK are committed to economic stability and sustainable development, and our industrial structures are highly complementary, it's a shared responsibility for us to prevent and reject the practice of overstretching the concept of national security, or using economic and trade issues as a tool or a weapon for political, political manipulation. <coughs> We need to strengthen pragmatic cooperation to drive our common development for the benefits of our two peoples. Question number three, will China refuse to assume more international responsibility as it talks more about its own interests? Indeed, we are um, steadfast in defending our core national interests and dignity and taking resolute measures against the erroneous act that violates China's sovereignty and or interferes with China's internal affairs. But at the same time, we are a party, a political party with a global vision. We have always been a builder of world peace, a contributor to global development and a defender of international order. As countries with global influence and members of the United Nations Security Council, both China and the UK show the responsibility for the international system and global affairs. So it is a shared responsibility for us to say no to a new Cold War, group politics and bloc confrontation. We need to strengthen communication and coordination on international issues and make active contributions to addressing global 
issues such as climate change and biodiversity to realize lasting peace, universal security, and common prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, during the 11th China-UK Leadership Forum yesterday, we spent 12 hours together with our British colleagues for dialogue and exchanges. It is natural that differences are still there. Yet, through the dialogue, our common understanding has been expanded. We are both of the view that a sound China-UK relationship serves the interests of our peoples and the world, and that we should seek common ground by reserving the differences for the purpose of knowing and understanding each other better. We both hope that China and the UK engage in a win-win cooperation to actualize common development, and that we demonstrate the sense of responsibility to meet global challenges. I remember the mission of Chatham House is to help governments and societies build a sustainable, secure, prosperous, and just world, showing its broad global vision through its space. It's based in the in the uh, though it's based in the UK. To build a better world is our shared goal. The Communist Party of China always welcomes genuine suggestions on our future development, on Chinese modernization, on its relationship with the rest of the world. So I thank you very much for giving me such an opportunity to talk and interact. So, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much. I shall uh, grill you shortly. Or, uh, but let me just, uh, as I said, I'll guide you guys to be ready in about 15 minutes. So if you are sitting here in the room and you would like to ask a question, please stay seated and raise your hand and you, uh, you will be called on and a mic will be provided. Uh, please identify yourself uh, and as I said already, make sure it is a question and not some philosophical uh, statement of your life. Uh, and for our colleagues online, you must submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom feed. The chat and raise hand functions are disabled. And I will see your questions if everything's working well with technology right in front of me here. Um, so with that in mind, let me uh, start off. And first of all, thank you so much for speaking in English. It is uh, a sign of your staggering international experience that you managed to do that so easily and uh, within 20 minutes. So thank you very much for that. So <laughs> let me, I, I've set myself up for being tough. So it's partly because given I have bricks stamped on my forehead, most people think I would never ever ask a Chinese person a tough question. So in the general context of the things that we don't like, we in the West. Uh, it was very interesting in your, towards your closing comments, you mentioned about how strongly and um, I think the right words, uh, you would defend uh, your, any uh, influence on your internal affairs, I think it was. In some ways, It seems to me at times part of China's response to things that are said here in the UK and to some degree, if not many degrees also from elsewhere, particularly the US, is because you believe that they are internal affairs that we should have no view on. Um, is that a correct assessment? So and would you like to expand on whether that be the Uyghurs, uh, broader human rights, which I'll come back to. Uh, obviously, with this country, Hong Kong issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you very much for the question. I think that the uh, we have never refused to discuss issues that we consider to be domestic domestic uh, affairs with uh, with other countries on the basis of equality and with respect. Because uh, you know, I think that the we have had 
many, many rounds of uh, human rights consultations with the United Kingdom and uh, you, uh, other um, uh, Western partners. So it's not a taboo in our foreign policy. But the only thing is that when we do such exchange of ideas and interactions on these quote unquote sensitive issues, we do want to do it on the basis of equality and mutual benefit uh, and, 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 and mutual respect because some very often when we hear comments from these countries that have shown some kind of interest in China's human rights issue, they do it as a lecturer. They do it which is not based uh, on the principle of mutual respect. So we, are, we don't really want to listen to these lectures, but we do want to listen to the views and comments on the basis of uh, respect. Now that is very important. Uh, number two, we do regard uh, some issues as the internal issues of China, but that not really stop us from having, as I said, interactions. And uh, so I think this is also a perfect place for me to explain the uh, shortly, uh, well, very concisely, the issues that you mentioned, for example, uh, Hong Kong issue and uh, the, 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 what we call the Uyghur issue. Uh, actually, the Hong Kong issue became um, noted by the, the United Kingdom was actually in the year of 2019. In the year 2019, everybody here knows about what happened that year. We were seeing an anarchical society. We didn't see any law and order in Hong Kong. We, see, we saw only riot, violence, looting, arsoning, killing, well, brutal acts. So that's something that is never acceptable to the people of Hong Kong or the people of the entire China. I just imagine what could happen in, here in this country when you in, encounter such very bad and brutal rights. So we have to resume law and order in Hong Kong. And that serves an interest not only the Chinese people, the Hong Kong people, but the British people in Hong Kong as well. You have such a big number of uh, companies, banks, and you also have a lot of British nationals who are working or studying there. So we want to resume uh, law and order, and that does not mean that we are moving away from the formula of one country, two systems, but rather we are adhering to such a principle, and we are not moving away from the notion of Hong Kong people governing Hong Kong. So I think there's some misunderstanding, and maybe there's some things that don't really like to see, but you have to be realistic and you have to be reasonable and giving us a, 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 you know, what you have in mind you know, when we want to restore law and order, which is a must for any, any, civiliz any civilization, and any state, any country. With the uh, issue of Xinjiang, and I don't think that it should be you know, pinpoint the, the, the weaker issue, it's not a weaker issue. We have 56 ethnic groups in China. And in Xinjiang, we have maybe 15 ethnic, well, ethnic, uh, uh, minority ethnic groups. Uyghurs is one of them. And we have uh, the Tajiks, the uh, Kyrgyz, and also Russians, and many, many others. So the core of the Xinjiang issue should not be put into the context of human rights. It should be put into the context of fighting against terrorism. The United Kingdom is a very bad victim of terrorism. And terrorists are our common, dangerous, and brutal enemies. The same thing with China. The same thing with that part of China in Xinjiang. Because we have pathways between Xinjiang and some Central Asian countries. And Back in 1980s, or oh, let me see, back in 1990s, we got intelligence that such a large number of people from Xinjiang fled to Central Asia and got trained by the Al-Qaeda or by the Taliban. We knew that. But right, right after the uh, September 11th incident, that became more rampant. 
more and more people came back and, you know, started to kill. So we lost so many lives, both Uyghurs and people of other ethnic groups. So that must be stopped. So we have to have a very strong hand on these terrorists, but not on the Uyghurs. Um, so it's, this is a kind of, a kind of uh, uh, strategy that we have to protect our people in Xinjiang. So that's why I said that it should not be put into the context of human rights is really a matter of uh, fighting against terrorism, because fighting against terrorism serves as the common task and is, 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 is part of the international effort fighting against terrorism. Thank you. Let me tell you, and I'm already mindful of the clock, it's incredible how quickly time moves. Um, I want to have three different things if possible, but I've got to do it in five minutes. So, uh, coincidentally, you arrive here a day after Tony Blinken uh, was in Beijing. Um, any flavor of how you feel or China feels about the, 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 the visit? Was it, was it helpful or was it a, a step backwards? Well, that is the easiest part of the question, maybe, because I was, I didn't really read the report, and I was sort of involved in the in the uh, meetings between Blinken and other Chinese leadership. But, but anyway, I read in the news, and I knew the, the pathway for, uh, for such interaction between the Chinese uh, and the diplomats and the uh, American chief diplomat. You know that the there was a consensus between President Xi Jinping and President uh, Biden in the Biden Island, up at the, in Bali last year. And since things should have been expected to move in accordance with the consensus reached between the presidents, but you know, this went uh, another way and there were some very bad moves um, on the US side with, re with regard to the Taiwan issue. We saw, you know, the high level visit by by uh, Speaker well, Nancy Pelosi, and which really resulted in the tension uh, across the Taiwan Strait. And then we have seen the uh, balloon thing, which really poisoned the atmosphere for high-level interactions. But all in all, I think that these are the, the uh, happenings, but these happenings are based on US intention and strategy against China which is based on the wrong uh, calculation on, on China. So I think that the starting point of the US policy against China would be, well, they, in their words, would be containment, uh, the kind of uh, pressurizing and competition. Well, sometimes they mention the word adversarial um, uh, nature. So uh, for that, I think that the, 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 there need to be more interactions between the uh, Chinese diplomats and the American diplomats. And I think that Blinken's visit to China uh, was one of them. So I do believe that this kind of uh, interactions is, is useful. And, um, and um, I think it's also, uh, as, as explained in the press release, that it's con constructive. So I do believe in that. The, talks lasted the, between the foreign ministers last, lasted about eight hours. And, um, and also he had a chance to meet the President Xi. And I could only tell you so much sure. from the news. Let, because, me, uh, let me just <laughs> ask uh, one of my other two, and I'm hoping that the other one might come up, but if not, I'll find a way. So uh, again, for me personally, but I think it has great interest more broadly. Uh, one reads a lot about a possible expansion of the BRICS group. Um, you going to what? What from a Chinese perspective? What is the purpose behind that? If it's if what we read is true. Thank you. Um, I'm really honoured to see you, who is regarded as the father of the BRICS, and you okay. transform the world. You are not that old as a father. I can't, I can't <laughs> rub it off. <laughs> But anyway, um, I think this, uh, well, it's a wonderful imagination of international relations and you put all these major economies or developing or um, uh, fast moving economies together. So that's the right move. And I think the 
is well well received by the BRICS countries, and we already had an enlargement, which was the South, which was South Africa. You didn't yeah. include South no, Africa. No, they never asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? Maybe I gave an answer that is wrong. <laughs> But the uh, China basically favors for uh, favors an expansion of um, of um, the the BRICS, and I, I don't know what you're going to call it uh, in the future. You could call it BRICS Plus or something, uh, because, because we don't really want to lose the word break or BRICS. But anyway, the reason why we favor an expansion is that we do see more emerging economies than the five themselves. So I think there should be a larger, uh, a bigger say by the emerging economies in the national governance of the economy. And uh, well, when you see the, the G20, you see basically 10 developed countries and 10 develop, developing countries or major emerging economies. So I think that it's, it's, it's only natural that we can see an expansion of the break. So the, uh, the, the, the international economic governance Need these countries. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to forget my others for now. There's a, uh, I'm going to do slightly the opposite of what I planned, just to be clear that you're not being punished for being online. Uh, one of the online ones, which doesn't have a name attached to it, but it's a very intriguing question. It's slightly mischievous, but I, I like mischievousness. I hope I can get it. <laughs> Please give us a sense of of when you say or when we think of we in the West. Here's the naughty bit. From a Chinese perspective, which are the best nations within the West? <laughs> and, and are the subgroups? And are we a bad guy or a good guy? Uh, OK. Um, <laughs> I don't really see any uh, best, but I, can do see, I, I do see better policies on certain issues from the Western countries. And not only the West, but global countries. So I can only judge on the on the policies of each country. For example, Britain is a champion of openness, open world trade, um, uh, globalization, and multilateralism. So when you say that, well, I would say that Britain is good in terms of such policies with regard to global governance. And um, but when you talk about some other countries, I don't really want to meet them because we I'm here in Britain, so I can only decide I can only decide the uh, the, the United that. Kingdom. But you know, all countries have uh, right and wrong policies, so you can't really say that it's the best. It's the best. It's a better one. Or... <laughs> I tried. Okay, audience here. I see a gentleman at the front. Please say who you are and be as brief as possible with your question. Okay, <clears throat> Dominic Dudley, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I want to ask you about China's role in the Middle East. You've obviously, you mentioned the Saudi-Iran rapprochement. Does that sort of set the scene for other similar engagements? Might you try, I know, I think China's talked about trying to deal with the Israel-Palestine issue. Are there other conflicts which yeah. you might try to get involved in? Let's and, just hold that for a sec. Uh, we, we, Any, oh my oh, goodness, sorry, okay. just one sec. Uh -huh. Any other questions of that sort of flavour? Okay. Lady at the back. Thank you, Minister. My question was about uh, um, Amiya Kilara from Intermediate. I work with Jonathan Powell as Senior Projects Director. Uh, so my question was about the Global Security Initiative again and China's role in mediation and dialogue. And I wanted to ask you just two related questions. The first was... Only one. Um, <laughs> There's at least 20 hands up. One yeah. question. So sort of how does China distinguish its approach to mediation and dialogue from the Western approach to, this, to similar issues, uh, including on conflicts like Ukraine? And how could we better help China and the West cooperate on, on mediation issues? OK, thank you. Let's take those two for now. And I'll, you guys are tough. We do, we do want to see more uh, rapprochement in, uh, in the Middle East, Middle East. And China certainly wishes to play a, a role. And we, we were proud that we could bring uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia together so they, they normalize their relations with with each other in Beijing. And I hope that is very good momentum. And we could really see a trend of uh, rapprochement and, and, uh, and, and peacemaking 
among the uh, Middle East countries, uh, not only between Israel and some other Arab countries, but also between and among the Arab countries themselves. But of course, we could not deny the fact that the uh, Palestinian issue is still the, the, the very difficult and tough issue to settle. And uh, China's position on that issue remain unchanged. So we support the Palestinians, but we also see all countries have the right to exist, to, to exist on that land. And we hope to see uh, uh, international efforts that can push for, uh, for peace between Israel and Palestine. And China will certainly be part of the, the effort. And with regard to the security initiative, yes, China is always on the side of peace, and that is not the jargon, but actually it's what China has been working on. And uh, we are very sad to see such a major conflict that is going on in Europe, in, your, in, in, a, in a place where it's supposed to be, peace, uh, to be peaceful. And so there are two sides of China's position on this. Number one, that, that we, we, we certainly uh, uh, adhere to the principles of respect to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of another country. So we don't really want to see any kind of uh, 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 conflict, any kind of war, or any kind of military uh, actions against sovereign country. On the second, uh, I think that we should observe the uh, comprehensive uh, security of all nations uh, uh, concerned, because uh, we don't really want to see any country seeking extreme security at the sacrifice of another country that is really seeing threat to that country. So I know that this is not the, the Ukraine issue is, uh, is very uh, complicated, but all in all, China stands for peace and uh, we try to bring about. Uh, so uh, you mentioned peace. Ukraine. One of the next, or well, one of the many questions online is about Ukraine from Callum Wilson. I shall ask it slightly differently than it's written here, um, but I'll get to the gist of it. It's also quite frank and blunt. Do you, well, actually I'll add my slight twist to it as well. Do you think it's caused any damage to China's international credibility in terms of China's stance mm -hmm. on uh, the invasion of Ukraine uh, or not? Well, it really depends on which country. Well, as far as the European countries, and I do understand your feelings and emotions towards the Ukraine crisis, when you understand that, because we do see a, see a casualty, we do see people being killed uh, on the battlefield, and it's something that we, we, we will never like to see. Uh, but we have to be um, sophisticated and, and realistic about the, the issue, because uh, we do, I personally, as a diplomat, I, I feel sad to see that these um, crises fail to be pre prevented in the first place. And I see, I've been reading different views on the relations between NATO and Russia, which some people believe could be the cause of this crisis. I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm commenting on it, but I do see conflicting views on this, even among the Westerners. Number one. Number two, China is, as I said, China is on the side of peace. We will try to do our bit in bringing about a ceasefire and a, a kind of uh, uh, bring the two countries uh, to the negotiation table, which seems to be very difficult at the moment. So we have to be realistic. But what, how are we going to be realistic? That we should try all our best to stop the possible escalation of the crisis because we believe it could result in very dangerous scenario. So you, you see what I mean? So, um, so we don't want to see uh, okay. escalation. Let me come back to the, oh my goodness me. Uh, there's somebody right at the back, gentleman with glasses and a white shirt on. Uh, thank you very much. James King from the Financial Times. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister Leo. Uh, my question is on the Global Development Initiative. Um, there is a group at the United Nations called the Friends of the Global Development Initiative. Could you say how many countries are in that? And are any G7 members already among the, the friends of the GDI? Um, or is the GDI really China's uh, attempt to further embrace the Global South? Thank you. 
I'll take that one on its own, actually. Yes. Please. Hi, James. So, so nice to see you after so many years. But uh, yes, and thank you very much for following the, uh, the Global uh, Development Initiative. And uh, thank you very much for mentioning the, 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 the Friends Club of, of, of this initiative. We do see a lot of uh, developing countries who are happy to join this uh, club, but uh, we don't really see too many uh, G7 members. But I think, no, we, we haven't received any objection or opinion of objection to this initiative. I think that they agree to the essence of this uh, initiative. So we are happy with that. And I think that we can uh, really push forward with this. So uh, I, the Belt and Road Initiative is certainly one of the major uh, uh, actions that we take in, uh, for the purpose of uh, what, is, what is enshrined in the initiative. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that we're getting more and more support from the inter general international uh, community. So we do believe that the three initi initiatives combined, security and, and, and civilization combined, will be um, a three pillars for the what we call, what we propose the uh, human uh, mankind for a shared future thank you okay thank you there's uh, i'm trying to be fair to very equal here this lady with the glasses on thank you i apologize in advance because Virtually every one of you seems to want to answer, ask a question. <laughs> Thanks, it's Patricia Lewis, uh, Head of International Security here at Chatham House. Sorry, I can't see you hard. either, Patricia. It's all right, Jim. It's very hard. I know I do it all the time and I have the same problem. So. Um, and thank you very much indeed, Minister, for an excellent presentation. And um, I was really uh, intrigued by you referring to China's no first use policy of nuclear weapons. Sorry. No first use policy okay, of okay. nuclear weapons. Okay. And we've had the Secretary of Defense here, uh, sorry, at Munich, talk about, you know, preventing the use and the taboo of use of nuclear weapons. So um, I guess my question is, how do we stop the use of nuclear weapons? How are we going to reinvigorate arms control and disarmament and non-proliferation measures, um, and, and particularly between Russia and the US, given the circumstances, and how can China help in that regard? For your answer, anybody else that wants to ask a question close to this? Because if it's another defence one, I'm not going to take it. Oh, no? Okay. Yeah. Um, at the very early stage after the uh, Ukraine crisis, China made it very clear that China is against the use of nuclear weapons or the threat of using nuclear weapons. Number one. Number two, we pledge that all the partners concerned should try their best to stop the crisis, the situation from escalating. And apart from that, I don't really see anything that could really stop a nuclear power from the possibility of using it, except China, because we pledge not to be the first to use nuclear weapons. OK, let's come back over this side. Somebody in blue at the back. Um, Hugo Barker, a student at Imperial College. Do you see opportunities for cooperation on emerging technologies such as AI? Um, or do you see us entering into a period of competition between our um, regions? And on top of that, do you see okay. China having a One competitive question. advantage? One question. Thank you. Um, in that spirit, uh, the one, one of the ones I was going to raise, and it's many online, about the whole issue of access to the Chinese market as it relates to this specific question as well? OK, AI. China would seek further development of our own AI industry. And we were um, uh, doing quite well at the moment. But I think AI has two sides, as everybody knows. So we are open to international collaboration and international consultations on how to govern the outcome of AI. On the, ben on the one hand, it will certainly ben benefit mankind. On the other side, it could be dangerous or risky for mankind. So we are open to any kind of international uh, uh, thinking and uh, acting uh, on this issue. So I think it's time for uh, countries to join together 
on the governance of AI. Thank you. And on the, uh, the broader issue of uh, both the per perception and I think in some cases strong belief that there is still not fair access to the domestic Chinese market. You mean it, on, 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 from the rest what? of the world? Okay. Of us, of us benefiting from the rise of the Chinese consumer and the Chinese economy. As I explained at the, uh, when I was just uh, about to speak, uh, we are China, as I said, that we are committed to the high uh, standard of uh, opening up. So we are never hesitant to work with other partners, both the West and the emerging ones, on, uh, on um, uh, well, international governance and also uh, two-way or, or multi-way cooperation, so that's for sure. And I, another thing, is that we, don't, we are now seeing more and more globalization being reversed in many countries. We see one country put one country first, such uh, philosophies and, uh, and government initiatives. And we are seeing people talking about decoupling, though now they refrain from using such a word and they change it into de-risking. And yesterday I was saying that, you know, when you're saying de-risking, you have to define the risks. What are the risks? If you don't manage the de-risking well, you certainly will result in decoupling, which is dangerous for international economy. And China will be the, the, the first country that, that, you know, that, that hate to see it. So we are, we, 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 we will continue to be open. But we know, we know, we've noted uh, concerns from the uh, British business people uh, community and, uh, and, and others. They do have con some concerns over Chinese policies and things. We do need to have more explanations, I, I have to be honest with that. So, uh, so for example, the, yesterday I was approached with the question of the China's counter espionage uh, uh, act. Uh, that was a must for China because it's it's just a an improvement of the original law. It was not a new one because our security concerns and the immediate and actual threat to China has changed. So we have to change with that. But it does not really try to uh, to uh, keep the business business people away from us. So we have, we'll, we'll certainly do more explanations to the business community, and you have such a large one in China. We have had very, very useful interactions with the uh, British uh, the Chamber of Commerce in China. We will push them, certainly. So we okay. are still keeping an Let open hand. Let me try, uh, it's nearly one o'clock, but I'm going to try two more questions, I'm sorry. Um, I feel like I've come on this side of the room a lot. There's a lady towards the back with a hand up. Oh, it's Leslie. Yeah, it's Leslie. I, I uh, Leslie it was you, Leslie. I wouldn't have let you, but go on. Yeah, Leslie, I direct the U.S. and Americas program here at Chatham House. It's, an, it's, it's it, thank you for for visiting us. Um, as you know, Prime Minister Modi is enjoying a state visit in Washington, um, and I'm curious if you could say a little bit about uh, what your perception is of that visit and of the trajectory of that relationship. How does China feel about that? Let me take the one other question. Everyone's going crazy. I'm coming to the front, this Chinese or Asian gentleman towards the front. Linked to Leslie's question, as I sometimes jokingly say, it's a good job China and India never agree about anything, or then the BRICS would take over the world. But. Thank you, Minister Liu. My name is Chen Kai. I'm a Schwarzman scholar at Tsinghua University, and actually incoming research fellow at Chatham House. Um, so the media have labeled the assertiveness diplomatic style of Chinese diplomats as wolf warrior. What do you make of that term? Do you think that has helped, helped or hindered China's modernization and its relationship with the West? Leslie's question first. Okay. Are you um, envious of Prime Minister Modi? No, not at all. Not at all. You know that we we really wish to see uh, countries to have uh, uh, good relations. That you know, particularly among the major countries. Well, uh, the United the United States is certainly the biggest country in the world, developing country, developed country, and India is one of the uh, major uh, emerging economies. Certainly, we do want to see uh, such interactions. Uh, so we are happy uh, to see the Modi is uh, going to be is going to the United States, but certainly we have concern over something about the U.S. strategy of Indo-Pacific. 
Indo-Pacific is not inclusive, but rather is exclusive. So uh, China's initiatives, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and China's the three initiatives that we mentioned are all inclusive. We are welcome the, the, the accession, the role of all the countries in the world, including the United States, including India, including the United Kingdom. So we don't really want to see the, such exclusive nature of any kind of strategy. And uh, you know, our relations with the United States is of vital importance to the world and to the two countries. And our relations with India, uh, sometimes it's difficult. And uh, I, I won't agree with you in saying that <laughs> India will not agree on anything, but we have a lot of common ground on, for example, uh, common and differentiated responsibility of, on the uh, issue of climate change. Let me actually just throw, if I dare, this chair, something I've often said to uh, officials I've met now for the best part of a decade. In terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, which interestingly, uh, probably because of the time you haven't had much chance to talk about, but the th I want to ask you the same. Why not uh, invite the Indians to help design some of One Belt, One Road? We invite them and we want to include them. <laughs> and um, at the uh, uh, platforms such as the, uh, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS, the what do we have in common? Uh, uh, many uh, uh, platforms, we approach them. For, and we, we also initiated a joint uh, action plan, including South Asian countries like <coughs> Myanmar, India, Bangladesh, China. Okay. Yeah, and uh, that might seem to to uh, to prove your your idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which you mentioned just now. <laughs> this guy's question um, as the last question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We um, well, when we are under pressure, when China is under pressure, and China's external policies are, are under pressure, we do demonstrate a fighting spirit. But I, won't, I would be hesitant to call it uh, what, uh, what, what, what... Maybe better to what, just what, say spirit what, 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 what is fighting spirit. <laughs> no, but, at, but anyway, the starting point and the fundamental purpose of China's diplomacy is to make friends all over the world. We don't want to make enemies. And coming back to the question of America-India relationship, we don't really assume, but we should try to, to, uh, to uh, uh, not to um, assume that an enemy's friend is an enemy. It's not, it's not that case. So that's why, you know, why you don't really want to see, say that India, well, the United States something. So we want to deal with each one and each and every one of them. So that's my purpose. So at the starting point is to make friends, is to have a favorable international environment when China can really develop. But when uh, we are faced with challenges, when we are faced with threats from other powers, we have to, demonst we have to demonstrate a fighting spirit. Thank you. Okay, listen, thank you. That was exhausting for me, trying to just chair <laughs> everybody. Thank you for so much for your uh, appearance here and for your candidness. Uh, thank you to all of you for being so gracious and short. I uh, apologize to everybody, including online, that I couldn't get to you all. I think we could probably have also handled the 12 hours that you had yesterday, but such is life. So thank you very much and thank you to all of you.